Well, I'll, I'll wake you up with some <laughs> discussion of brachytherapy this morning. I'm going to talk about, in, in my first talk, I'll talk about brachytherapy technology and dosimetry. And then my second talk later on this morning, I'll talk about treatment planning and some quality assurance with brachytherapy. So let me start by talking about technology and dosimetry. <clears throat> and what about categories? Well, there are categories by the route at which you administer the brachytherapy. Intracavitary, you put the, the applicator into a natural cavity in the body, the esophagus, the rectum, the, um, <clears throat> the vagina, uterine canal, and so on. So natural cavities in the body, intracavitary. Interstitial, it used to be needles, and now it's catheters. You put these um, uh, and seeds directly into the patient. That's interstitial. Um, surface applicators, uh, not a lot of that work is done with brachytherapy. A lot of it would be done with electrons externally with uh, teletherapy. But there are quite a few people doing nowadays doing surface applicators with brachytherapy. We used to do it a lot before we had electrons. We've had electrons for 40 or 50 years now with linear accelerators, but prior to that, we didn't. And so we did a lot of, uh, a lot of brachytherapy for treating surface lesions, um, basal cell carcinomas, and so on. And then intraluminal, you put tubes into organs like the bronchus and arteries. And I don't know if a lot of that is done now. We, we went through a spell about 20 years ago when this was very popular, intravascular brachytherapy, we called it. And people thought this was going a long way. Apparently, it's kind of died out now, so not many people do that. Um, what about categories by dose rate? And these are my definitions, and I'll explain why mine are different from the official definitions. Uh, permanent implants, typically less than about 30 centigrade per hour, depending on the isotope you're using for the permanent implant. Um, low dose rate, now this is my definition, um, from 30 centigrade up to 100 uh, centigrade per hour. Um, you'll find in your textbooks that they go up to 200 centigrade per hour. And I don't like that because I've looked at data and it seems that you get significantly increased complications above about 100 centigrade per hour. So you start running into radiobiological problems once you get above 100 centigrade per hour. So I like to define 100 centigrade per hour as the upper limit for so-called low-dose rate brachytherapy. And then high-dose rate brachytherapy, high enough to give enough radiation in a single session. So above about 1,200 centigrade per hour. And it's usually fractionated, but not always. And then pulse brachytherapy. What is pulse brachytherapy? Pulse brachytherapy uses equipment just like a high-dose rate machine, but in pulses, maybe once every hour. So the patient is usually an inpatient, lying in a bed, but now by, by using a high-dose rate machine and turning on the pulse for maybe a minute, one minute every hour, you simulate low-dose rate. You're getting repair, and that's what low-dose rate is all about. You're getting repair while the patient is lying in bed, which you wouldn't with a normal high dose rate machine. You're allowing repair between pulses. So it, it simulates, it almost simulates, low dose rate brachytherapy. Problem there is the patient's lying in the bed. A big advantage of that is to the staff that's looking after the patient, because while the machine is turned off, which is maybe 90% of the time or 95% of the time the machine is turned off. People, nursing staff can go in and look after the patient. Visitors can come in and so on. So it has an advantage. Low dose rate brachytherapy doesn't. What about loading? Well, manual or hot loading is very rarely done these days, although well, that's not true because we do hot load um, seeds into the prostate, so that's, that's not true. I wasn't thinking. I'm thinking of the old days when we actually hot-loaded cesium sources or even radium sources, if you go back far enough, right into the patient, and, and the physician would actually hold the source in, in, in a pair of tweezers and push it into the patient, and I've seen that done many times. In fact, I used to work with a radiation oncologist 
who boasts that he could push him in with his fingers, and he developed lots of cancers, so <laughs> it wasn't a very good example. But manu manual hot loading is, is a problem because of the staff. Um, manual after loading is much more common, where you put an applicator into the patient, and then you load it afterwards. And that's pretty much what's done with, with prostate implants, for instance. You actually put the, the catheters into the patient, and then you afterload it. And I'll show you some examples with breast cancer, too, that you can afterload those into the patient. So manual afterloading is a lot less dose to the physician doing the job. And uh, remote afterloading, we all know about remote afterloading with high dose rate or pulse dose rate. Uh, it's usually fractionated or pulsed. Now, what about different source types? We used to use a lot of tubes, tubes that would go into catheters in the patient or into applicators that you put into the patient. You put an applicator, say, into the uterine canal, and then you put a tube through that applicator. We don't use those much anymore. Look at the dimensions of that tube. It's quite, quite a large diameter. Um, we used to use cesium, for instance, and they're about three millimeters diameter, and that means that the tube that you put it in has to have quite a large di diameter, and that can be uh, a problem. Patients don't like you putting needles in that have a large diameter into their breast. I don't blame them at all. Um, so we don't use that much anymore. Needles, again, we don't use needles all that much anymore, um, but this is how it was done originally. We, we stuck needles into patients, tumors, and, uh, and treated them that way. Um, wires, uh, much more common, and just, these are usually made of iridium, and I'm going to show you later on that iridium can be made much smaller, much smaller diameter, maybe one millimeter diameter, where you might need a tube uh, or, a, or a needle would be, of cesium would need maybe three millimeters diameter. So the, the needles are much smaller to go into the patient. Um, Actually, a lot more common are seeds in a ribbon, such as iridium seeds in a ribbon. Um, cobalt 60 spheres with spacers. That I don't know if any, does anyone have a high dose rate unit with cobalt 60 spheres? We've got some. My first high dose rate unit had spheres of cobalt. The problem is, and we'll see in a minute, that those cobalt spheres are pretty big diameter compared to iridium that we use in, in other high dose rate machines, in most high dose rate machines. So again, you've got big catheters that these have to fit into. But there are some advantages of cobalt 60, especially in countries that can't keep replacing the source, as you have to with the iridium source. And then finally, stepping sources in a catheter, example, high dose rate brachytherapy with iridium stepping sources in, and you can create the pattern. And you can create a pattern with the cobalt 60 spheres too. But you've got to create the pattern and then put the spheres in. Whereas with the stepping source, you can just step the source. One source can be stepped. And, and the dwell time of the source can be changed to match the dose distribution that you want. So it's more versatile. And, and you can do it at the time that you're treating the patient. With the cobalt 60 spheres, you have to organize everything beforehand because that's the pattern you're going to get in, inside the patient. You have hot spheres and cold spheres. In fact, you can see there's some red ones and some white ones there. The red ones are the hot spheres, and the white ones are like little balls that are not radioactive. Same size, but not radioactive. Clinical applications of brachytherapy. Let me, uh, if I can, yes, here we go. Um, so low dose rate, we can have continuous low dose rate or pulse low dose rate, which is equivalent, roughly equivalent to low dose rate. And you can see with the continuous, typically iridium wires or iridium in wires, iridium seeds in wires. And these are just some of the things that are, are typically treated with this system, skin and head and neck. Actually, all these clinical examples are just some examples. You can pretty much treat anything with anything. You can treat all. So, so with iridium wires, you don't just have to treat skin and head and neck. You can use iridium wires in other parts of the body, too. Um, pulsed, similar things, head and neck. You can do skin. Gynecological, quite often used pulsed systems and so on. With uh, permanent uh, implants, typically prostate. 
can use it elsewhere, but most of the time, 99% of the time, it's probably used for prostate. These seeds, I'm going to go over these a little bit more later on, maybe in my second talk. Um, high dose rate fractionated or in single doses, most of the time it's fractionated. Of course, you need special equipment, as you do with pulse low dose rate, you need special equipment. Um, and that can be used just about treating anything here. Okay. What about the energy of the sources? Well, all photoemitting isotopes can be pretty much grouped into two categories. High energy, and I define that as greater than about 50 keV. I've seen other people use 100 keV. And these have similar attenuation characteristics in tissue, regardless of the energy. They're pretty similar in tissue. Whereas low energy isotopes, they, they vary significantly in tissue, depending on which isotope you use, and in shielding character characteristics. Because they're very low energy, um, you don't need much shielding. In fact, you can send the patient home. I wouldn't want to send the patient home with, some, with, with an isotope in, say, of 80 keV, which is why I like to define the high energy as being above 50 keV, not 100 keV. So I think of it more in terms of shielding and what you can do with the patient. The patient can go home. Let's look at some important isotopes. And cesium-137 was very important to us. When we first started doing brachytherapy, well over 100 years ago, we used radium. And then eventually we started using radon seeds, pretty much the same characteristics of rad radium, same high, very high energy. Um, and radium is a big problem because it's very high energy, very difficult to sh shield. And radium tubes can break. And radon gas can leak out, and then you have to close the hospital because you've really damaged, you've got radon all over. The, we, we actually did that in our hospital, but fortunately it wasn't broken. We thought we'd broken one, but it wasn't broken. But we had to seal off all the doors. We called in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to, with all their instruments. Thank goodness it didn't break. A, a safe cracked down on top of it, and we thought it cracked right through it, but it missed. So we were lucky. So, but as happened, hospitals have had to be closed. And often you don't know it's broken. It's got a crack in it, and you're radiating everybody around. So it's a big problem with radon, so we, radium. So we gave up radium and introduced cesium probably about 30 or 40 years. Anybody using radium? No, we don't use radium anymore. Radium has a wonderful half-life, 1,600 years. So your source is going to last longer than us. Um, unfortunately, that's bad news too, because if you lose one, it's going to be there for lots of years, and you might, be, uh, might have a problem with, with that radium source. So we've got rid of our radium sources and replaced them with cesium. Cesium has a 30-year half-life. Great, you don't have to keep replacing them. Um, but they do decay. You've got to take into account the decay of the source, which isn't a big problem. It's easy. The mean energy is about 660 keV, still high, but not as high as radium. Radium goes up above an MeV, so it's a little easier to shield cesium sources. The half value layer of lead, is, you can see it's uh, five, just over five millimeters, so a lot of shielding is needed when you use cesium sources. We used to carry shields in, not carry, wheel, with big wheels, shields into the patient's room when we were using cesium and put it so that when the nurse goes in, they can stand behind the shield and stop themselves from getting too much radiation. But it's still a big problem. OK, this factor now I'm going to show. It's the, what we call the specific gamma ray constant, sometimes the exposure ray constant. And this tells you how much radiation comes out of a source of unit strength, say one one millicurie here. And, and notice it's in exposure units. It's Rontgens per millicurie per hour at one centimeter. We don't use this much anymore. And there are lots of reasons why. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time explaining why we don't use this anymore. First of all, I want you to notice it's a small number. We're going to show you much higher numbers later on. And even more important, specific activity. Specific activity is how many curies you can pack into a gram. 
This is relatively small number, 86 curies in a gram of tissue. So what that means is these sources have to be pretty big, and I already explained that, three millimeters diameter to be able to have a source that's reasonable for brachytherapy treatment. Principal uses, I mentioned, it's the first re radium replacement for low-dose rate brachytherapy, particularly. We don't use them for, I don't think anybody's ever used, I might be wrong, I don't think anybody's used cesium for high-dose rate brachytherapy. Sources would be too big. Pack all that into one source would give you a, quite a big source. Let's talk about this specific gamma ray constant or exposure ray constant. It relates the activity to the output. The output in that case was in Bronkens, not gray or centigrade, which is what we really want. We really want to know the dose to the patient, not the exposure. Of course, you measure the exposure because you use an ionization chamber to measure it. But really, we want dose. It's a, been a big source of error in traditional systems because it relies on an accurate knowledge of activity and an accurate knowledge of the effect of encapsulation on your measurement of activity, which can be a problem with low energy sources because a lot of the radiations that are coming out get absorbed and you don't count them. And with high energy sources, because you've got a very inefficient system, because you're missing a lot because they're getting out. So it's, it's been a problem with determining the, the activity of the sources. But we did it because we had no other dosimetry system. It's not used much in present-day brachytherapy source specification. And most of the rest of my talk this morning is going to be about the modern brachytherapy dosimetry. <clears throat> it's been replaced by what we call the dose rate constant. So I'll be talking quite a lot about the dose rate constant. So that's new, and its dose rate is not exposure anymore. And it's something that's related to things that we can measure in-house very hard to measure the activity of a source in-house, where it's, this is much easier to measure in your department to check that the vendor has given you the correct um, activity for the sources that they're selling you. Big leap came when uh, Iridium-192 was introduced. It's got a 74-day half-life bad news. You've got to keep replacing it. And you have to very important that you keep correcting the output of this source for the K. Easy to do, we physicists can do that. Mean energy, 330 kV, ah, a little bit better, a little bit easier to shield. Its half value layer in lead is now 2.5 millimeters, so it's a bit easier to shield. You still need shielding, though. This is still pretty high energy. Look at the specific activity. We can pack over 9,000 curies into a gram of iridium, much smaller sources. And that's one of the reasons why it's become so important. So it's used as a replacement for cesium, for seed implants, and as an HDR sepping source, and, and PDR, pulse dose rate too. Let's look at another potential source that we have used a little bit and I mentioned it before in the early high-dose rate machines that some people still have, cobalt-60. Big advantage over iridium, it's got a five-year half-life. So you're not replacing the source every three months, as you probably would be doing most of the time with a, an iridium high-dose rate machine. With a cobalt high-dose rate machine, you don't have to replace the source um, for a long time. Very useful. The mean energy, unfortunately, is a lot higher, so a lot more shielding is needed. Half value layer, 11 millimeters. Lots of shielding, much more than with iridium. So that's a problem. It's got an intermediate specific activity, it's kind of between iridium and cesium. So the sources have to be somewhat bigger than iridium, and that's why most of us have, have now got rid of those machines and replaced them with iridium machines. And the principal use is high dose rate, intracavitary, and again, pulsed dose rate. And not just intracavitary, anything, but they're often used in high dose rate. The, the reason it's intracavitary here and not interstitial is the sources are too big, and you've got to make big holes in the patient. They don't like that, and 
So it's mainly in natural cavities in the body. So most of the time, are you using it for interstitial at all or just intracavitary? Everything? Yeah, if, you, if that's all you've got, you've got to use it for everything. But you do have to put big needles into the patients and they tend not to like that too much. Um, it's got the advantage over iridium because of its long half-life, but the disadvantage because of the source size and the shielding that's required. Let's compare those properties that I've been mentioning. Easy to do. With cesium, in fact, I've got it here. With iridium-192, it's the easiest to shield. It's got the lowest half value layer in lead. It has the highest specific activity, so you've got the smallest sources, which is why it's possible, why it's the, now it's the preferred source for modern uh, high-dose rate machines. <clears throat> but source replacement can be a problem. You've got to replace a source maybe once every three months because of its half-life. Um, and cobalt-60, for, for, particularly for countries where replacing a source every three months is a problem, then cobalt-60 might be a, a, a better choice. Let's look at low energy isotopes. Remember, below 50 keV now. And we've pretty much got two major players in this field. I-125, which has a half-life of 60 days. Mean energy, very low, 28 keV. Means the half-value layer of lead is very low, so it's easy to shield. And very often, the patient can just be sent home with the, uh, with the I-125 seeds in them as we do with prostate cancer patients. Um, I have a friend who had to have a prostate implant and he was, I, I sent him to a, a, a specialist in New York who was world famous for his prostate implants. And my friend was so excited because he could take the subway home. <laughs> he couldn't believe that. He said, I'm radioactive and they let me take the subway home because he wasn't not enough radiation getting out of his body. He happened to be a big man, so he had a lot of natural shielding. Not enough radiation was coming out that it mattered that he could go home on the subway. Uh, and it's used for temporary implants also at high activity. You can, um, I don't know anybody who's doing this anymore, but I, I know we had quite a, a service in, in my town in Detroit where one of the big centers were doing high activity iodine seeds for the brain. Um, I didn't particularly like what they were doing, but and IPLAX, it's been used a lot in IPLAX. That's quite common still for treating ocular melanomas, for instance, behind the eye. You just put the seeds in behind the eye on a special applicator. <clears throat> and as a temporary implant, then you take them out a week later on, and they've had uh, enough radiation to treat that disease. Um, Palladium-103, very similar. Palladium-103 has got a shorter half-life. So when might you want to use palladium instead of iodine? Well, it's got a shorter half-life, so the radiation is delivered in a relatively shorter time. And that might be for a more rapidly growing cancer. You want to get the radiation in a little bit quicker. I'm not sure that's the way, that's the rationale that most radiation oncologists use for using palladium. It's got a uh, lower mean energy, slightly lower. Instead of 30 kV, it's 22 kV. Means less shielding. It's got 0 0.008 millimeters needed for half value layer in lead. Again, very easy to shield this. Principal use is just like ID-125, um, permanent implants of prostate and, and a few other few other cancers. Well, there are some new isotopes that are being considered. There's ytterbium-169. It's got a mean energy of 93 kV, so that's, some people would still call that low energy. Um, it's got a half-life of about 32 days, so more than, um, it, halfway between iridium, uh, between iodine-125 and, um, and palladium-103. It's a potential replacement for iridium, and it's got a lower energy, so it requires less shielding, and it's got an even higher specific activity than iridium, which means smaller sources. So people are, are promoting the use of ytterbium. I haven't got any experience with it. Anybody got any experience with ytterbium? Probably not. It's a new isotope. It's got some nice properties that one of the problems is 32-day half-life 
Iridium is 74 days half-life, so it's going to be, you're going to need to replace these more often. Um, you might be buying them just for a specific patient. And, and that's okay. The advantage of iridium, you can buy a batch of iridium and then it's useful for the next several weeks. This would start decaying too much, so it wouldn't be as useful. So that's a problem. Another isotope that's being considered is cesium-131. It's got a very short half-life and it's got a low energy. So this would be replacement for, um, for iodine implants, for permanent implants of prostate, for example. Again, I haven't got any experience. Anybody cesium-131? Probably not. Um, it's a new idea that's being promoted. Lots of papers being published on it. Um, but I don't know too many pe people are using this yet. But if a manufacturer, if a vendor decides that this is something to, to promote, you might be seeing cesium-131 and ytterbium-169 sources in, in the relatively near future. And then, something we have been seeing, electronic brachytherapy. Anybody have electronic brachytherapy here? Okay, let's talk about electronic brachytherapy. That is here. I know lots of people using electronic brachytherapy. So what is electronic brachytherapy? Electronic brachytherapy uses a miniature x-ray tube instead of a radioactive source. And this is what it looks like. And that's a finger. Behind there is a finger with that, uh, with that x-ray tube on that finger. It's tiny. This can go into catheters in the patient, into, into cavities in the patient. So it can be used very much like iridium. And in fact, you can attach this to what basically would be a high-dose rate remote afterload and use it for high-dose rate remote afterloading. And people are now doing that. It's got a big advantage. You can turn it off. You just throw the switch. It's turned off. Now anybody can go in and handle it, and it's much easier to, to protect people from the radiation. So let's get some details. The tube's inserted into catheters the way we do high dose rate. It, it can be used to replace iridium. Most people haven't yet. Um, shielding, storage, handling, and dose distribution advantages over iridium. Let's look at what it looks like now. This is a typical source. You can see it's about two millimeters diameter, a little bit bigger than the iridium, which is usually about one millimeter diameter, so it's a little bigger. Um, but the source, 10 millimeters long, not that much different from the iridium seeds that we use today. And, and you another thing you can do, you can change the energy. You can adjust the voltage if you want to, so you not only can have optimization from dose distributions, you can have optimization from energy distributions as well. So it's got an added advantage in terms of potential dose distributions. And the air coma rates, we're going to talk about air coma rates later on, are comparable to a 10 Curie high dose rate source, which is what's used in your high dose rate machine. So it's very similar. It doesn't decay, which is another advantage. So it's got some advantages, and you're probably going to be seeing electronic brachytherapy in, in the near future. And this is what the dose distribution looks like. It looks very much like the dose distribution around a high dose rate source. Now, I want to spend most of the rest of my time, I think all of the rest of my time today, talking about modern brachytherapy dosimetry. What do we now do that will make the dosimetry better than it was before? The current method used in treatment planning computers is based on AAPM task group 43. We're going to hear a lot about AAPM. You've heard about AAPM task group 43. And it's been updated uh, a little bit. So this has been in existence for about 20 years now. And it has lots of advantages over the uh, previous methods that we used. So what was wrong with the old dosimetry that we used before 20 years? So it, it's just like your dosimetry with external beam radiotherapy. We had these protocols come out, and one protocol, 20 years later, will enhance the accuracy of, measure, of determining the dose in the patient, and then another one will come out. I've, I've been working in the field for quite a while, and I've seen three major protocols with external beam um, dosimetry. Same thing's happening with brachytherapy. What was wrong with the old dosimetry? I mentioned some before. 
specification of the source strengthens activity. This is difficult to measure accurately and reproducibly, reproducibly both by the vendor and the user. Quite often, for instance, I would get a source and they would tell me, oh, this is a uh, 10 millicurie source, and then I would measure it and it would be a 11 or 12 milli, so maybe a 10 or 20% difference. And it wasn't that they were wrong, it was the way they were defining activity. They may have been correcting for the fact that you're losing some of the, the radiation in the encapsulation, or they may not have been doing that, maybe I'm doing that. And this is a big problem, and I'll show you some examples why it became a big problem. There's a variability in the factor to convert the activity to the dose. For example, prior to 1978, the specific gamma ray constants that I mentioned before, published for iridium mine 92, ranged from 3.9 to 5.0 R per hour per millicurie at a centimeter. Big differences in how you converted the activity into exposure in those cases, exposure in the patient. Then, of course, you convert that with the F factor into dose. So big differences, and it's all to do with this business of do you correct for, for absorption in the, in the material of the source, or don't you? And it's varied all over the, to, between vendors it varied, and it certainly varied a lot between users. So there, if I quoted, I give my patient 6,000 centigrade, Somebody else is giving exactly the same dose, but they're quoting 5,000 centigrade that they gave. There was a difference. And if, you, if a radiation oncologist goes from one department to another, and he asks for 6,000 centigrade to his patient, and he's only getting 5,000 over here, the chances are he'll never notice, but he'll be underdosing his patient. So it can be a problem. <clears throat> and it's preferable to use only quantities that derive from dose rates in a water medium rather than things like exposure in air. What we really want is what's the dose rate in our patient. So we now need to specify the strength in units that are not activity. So what do we do? In TG43, TG the old units before TG43, the old units when we had radium going way back, was milligrams of radium. And then it became milligram radium equivalents when we went to cesium. And I remember I always used milligram radium equivalents. I didn't use the real activity in millicuries. We used milligram radium equivalent because all the clinical experience developed in the previous 50 years of brachytherapy had been developed using milligrams of radium. So we wanted to just replace radium with cesium. That's long gone. We lost that a long time ago. Then we went to activity. And then I say, or apparent activity. What do I mean? Again, it's all to do with what gets out of the source and, and what you measure. Apparent activity is what they may be correcting the, the activity that you measure with a factor to account for the attenuation in the source. And so you've got a variety of different units here, activity and actually apparent activity. And this certainly became a problem. For TG43, we need a new unit that could be directly related to your in-house method of verifying the source strength. And this new unit is the air kerma strength. So instead of activity now, we express the source strength as in terms of air kerma strength. The air kerma strength is the product of the air kerma rate, which I'll define in a minute, due to photons of energy greater than delta, we'll explain that, in a small mass of air in vacuo, we'll explain that too, and the square of the distance. We put the square of the distance in there because that's the way it's defined. If the distance is one meter, then it's one. So you, don't multi you multiply by one. And we're gonna see the Europeans actually stipulated it at one meter, and so you don't need to multiply by the square of the distance, one meter squared. Okay, what is air coma strength? <clears throat> this is the property that can be related to the measurement for each source. The air coma strength is usually inferred from transverse plane 
air coma rate measurements performed in free air geometry, a distance large in relation to the linear dimensions of the source, typically one meter. So you're going you're to have a source, and you're going to measure along the transverse axis at a meter away. Well, that has the advantage that the source, which is usually about six millimeters long, by the time you get a meter, it's like a point source. So you don't have to take into account the geometry of the source for that measurement. Because of the large distance, the effect, should, the effect of source size, linear dimensions, is negligible. Why in vacuo? Well, the qualification means that the measurements are corrected for photon attenuation and scattering in air or any other medium imposed between the source and detector, and also any nearby objects like floors, walls, and ceilings. This isn't something we can do in our department. I've tried doing this, and I'll put a source in the middle of a big room like this, and it's amazing how much scatter gets to that source from, from the walls and the floor. It's very difficult, and this is something that the national calibration labs will, will be doing. They'll be specifying how, this, how measurements that we can do in our department relate to the source strength. Why energy greater than delta? Well, there's a cutoff delta um, intended to exclude any low energy photons that will increase the air coma strength but don't contribute to the dose to the patient. For instance, they don't get further than one millimeter, 0.1 centimeters into the patient. So they're just surrounding the source. We want to eliminate those because of tissue attenuation. They don't get more than a millimeter from the source. Typically, this is 5 keV. Units of air coma strength. Okay, this is the equation for air coma strength. And the unit is micro gray meter squared, or you can leave that out if it's at one meter, per hour. So micro gray per hour, the unit of, and one micro gray per hour um, for many users is called one U. One U unit is one micro gray per hour at one meter. The alternative to this unit is, this is the European unit, it's called the reference air coma rate, and this is the Euro European equivalent of air coma strength. It's numerically equal, but it's explicitly defined at one meter. So it's exactly the same thing, but explicitly they define it at one meter. Simplifies things a little bit. It's, it's usually simply microgray per hour, and it's therefore assumed that this is at one meter. So that's the strength of the source. Now let's look at how can we get from that. So if we know the strength of the source, how can we get from that to the dose in the patient? Okay. Well, the first thing we can do, and I'm going to do them in steps and show you the parameters that we have to use to do that, is to determine the dose rate along the transverse axis closer to the source. We now know what the dose is at a meter from the source. Let's determine it, what it is closer to the source, say at one centimeter, which is usually the reference distance for these sources. How can we determine that? Okay. And then, how do we account for the effects of absorption and scattering on this along the transverse axis. So we've got these measurements close to the source. How do we correct that for absorption and scattering in tissue? And then the next step is, how can we do that um, <coughs> off the transverse axis? So now, instead of just knowing it here, how can we get it anywhere else over here? So we want the dose distribution all around the source. How can we get it over here? Um, first of all, Let's just take into account inverse square law. Now, this is an extended source, so it's not simply 1 over r squared. You've got to take into account the dimensions of the source to get it around the source. So that's the next step. And then finally, how do we count for absorption and scattering on these off-axis dose rates? How can we take into account the self-absorption of the source itself and the encapsulation and scattering in the tissue? So... They're the, three, the, the four steps that we need to use to get the dose in the patient. And this is what TG43 does. So what about the dose rate closer to the source? We need a factor that would convert the source strength at one meter to the dose 
at a reference point, usually one centimeter, close to the source. How do we do that? Well, first of all, this is, this is going to vary from type of source to type of source. Every type of source with different encapsulation is going to have a different factor. And that's really important. We need to do that for any type of source so that our dosimetry for one type of source is exactly the same as somebody else's dosimetry, or even our dosimetry, with a different source in a different, in, in a different environment. The factor is the dose rate constant. So what is the dose rate constant? This is the dose rate per unit air coma strength of one centimeter along the transverse axis of the source. It includes the effect of the source geometry, the spatial distribution of radioactivity within the source, any cell filtration of the source, and scattering in the water. Remember, we defined this in vacuo at a meter. Now we've got it in water, because it's now in the patient. And so we have to make any corrections for absorption and scattering. So how do we know that? Well, it depends on the source structure. Unfortunately for us, somebody's done all the calculations already. And they all did it all, typically using Monte Carlo studies of, of, the, dis, uh, of the dose of one centimeter away on the transverse axis. And here's a good example where AAPM and Astro, Astro worked together to, to define these terms for all the different sources that we have. And uh, <clears throat> as I say, mainly Monte Carlo. And here's the information on just high-dose rate iridium sources. And you can see a whole variety of high-dose rate in different machines, sources in different machines. And they have different values for this, uh, this conversion factor. So the conversion factor is very highly specific to the exact structure of the source. And you can see all these different values here. All this information is in your treatment planning computers. It's all been put in there. You don't have to do it yourself. Although, if you want to do some hand calculations to check that your dosimetry system is working right on the treatment planning computer, you, you can use these values. They're all published in, uh, in, in the AAPM task group report. Now, the next thing, account for absorption and scattering in that dose. Okay. Well, we accomplish this by what's called the radial dose function. And it's a function, it's a small g, r meaning distance r. It accounts for dose fall off on the transverse axis. So we're still talking about the transverse axis of the source. We haven't gone over here yet. Transverse axis of the source. And it accounts for photon scattering and attenuation and so on. Um, consensus values of r, g, r, there have been a lot of studies published and the task group, um, AAPM report number 229, analyzes all this and comes up with a consensus value of, of this parameter for all the different sources that we have. And here's an example. You can't read it, but it just shows you for a whole variety of different high-dose rate sources. So all these things at the top there are all different high-dose rate sources. And this is the consensus value of that at uh, different distances. And it's defined as one at one centimeter. So we start one, one centimeter from the source is our normal. And then anything else along the central axis only here, um, it, it gives you specific values for each type of source. Again, very highly specific to the source itself. Well, what about the effect of source geometry off the transverse axis? So now let's go out here somewhere. And let's just use inverse square law only. Um, this function is called the geometry function. It's the ratio of dose rates in air at the point of interest, for instance, uh, anywhere at the distance r in any direction, to that reference point at r0, which would typically be one centimeter. Um, ignoring photon absorption and scattering is purely inverse square law. And actually, as you'll see when I show you the full equation, it's really relating the what's going on over here to what's going in on here in terms of inverse square law. So it's a ratio, really, of, of what's going on here to what's going on there. And, and because it's a ratio, lots of the potential errors cancel out, and you can use simplified form of the equation. We used to call this the Sievert integral many years ago, and we 
uh, older physicists knew we had to solve the sieve, but I, I don't think I ever solved it. But it's an integral, and it's very complicated to, to do it. I'm not going to show that because we don't need to do it anymore. Um, this is the geometry. We've got a point, a distance r, angle theta, and we've got the source of length L, and it's purely geometry, inverse square law. It replaces 1 over r squared. If it's a point source, it's always 1 over r squared. But it's not a point source anymore. It's a distributed source. It counts for the distribution of activity, and we can use a simplified form of the integral mathematically simplified form of the integral. For a line source, this is the equation for the, the um, geometry function. And for a point source, it's simply 1 over r squared. Okay? So that's what goes into your treatment plan. Let's say your treatment planning computer does it. It just uses a simplified form. Turns out the errors, by simplifying it, are quite negligible. And then finally, now we've got the Dose here due to inverse square law. What's the dose here really in practice? You've got to take into account absorption and scatter in the tissue. And this is accomplished by what we call the 2D anisotropy function, capital F, distance r, angle theta. And it accounts for anisotropy of dose distribution, including the effects of absorption and scatter in the medium. And then we've got consensus values that have been published Again, in AAPM report 229, and that's what all your treatment planning computers have in them. And this is just one example of, uh, for one type of source. This is, all this is for one type of source, and that's all been determined by primarily by M Monte Carlo uh, analysis. And all this data from this table is in your treatment planning computer. Okay? So the dose rate at the point, the full equation is this. You've got all these factors multiplied by each other to give you the dose rate at any point around your source. And this is what your treatment planning computer calculates. It uses that equation using the parameters that have been published, calculating the, the inverse square geometry that it can calculate very easily. But what if the orientation of the source isn't known? Or, or you're you can't bother to put it in because all the sources are at different angles. That, that can be a real problem. Well, what we then use is a 1D version of this. We simply have a 1D version of, <coughs> of this function. And it's a 1D anisotropy function. And what it does, it, you, you've got data around a distributed source like this, but you don't know the direction of the source. So it converts everything into what it would be for a point source. Okay? It, it integrates in 3D space all around your source and comes up with a single number at a distance r. That's the 1D anisotropy function. The equation is a little bit simpler, not much simpler. But now you've got the, <coughs> the uh, values for the, the 1D anisotropy function phi. And you've got this, geometry, this radial dose function for a point source now instead of for a, a long source. So it's basically based on inverse square law. And all these values are published, for instance, for seeds. Seeds are the most common source where you don't know the angle. You put seeds in, and they get distributed all around. They're also very small. And you could put that data in with all the angles of the sources, but most of the time you don't. You just assume they're point sources. And then you use the 1D uh, dose rate equation. And let me finish by talking about some improvements on this. We're already working on improving on TG43, the next version um, of, uh, of the symmetry is going to be based on models. And this is just like in your external beam treatment planning system. You've got a lot of modeling that goes in there um, to, to develop more accurate algorithms to calculate the dose. And this is all in, in task group report 186, model based planning. So, how what models are compared in TG186? They compare their latest model-based dosimetry with the previous versions. And what do they do? They look at TG43 and compare, compare it with TG43. And then they talk about the models. And these are very similar to your external beam models. You've got a, a model that takes into account primary and scatter and separates them out. You've got a model just like 
the CCC model in your external beam treatment planning system, collapse cone supervision convolution, a little bit better, a bit more physics. And then you've got Boltzmann solvers, solving the Boltzmann equation. We have that in our external beam treatment planning computers now. And then finally, Monte Carlo, which is probably the gold standard. So it looks at each of these. And, and I like this because it shows you gradually increasing the complexity to the right. You're increasing the complexity and you're increasing the physics in each of these. Go from TG43 and, uh, and, this, the, and, and separating primary and scatter. These are basically factor-based. There's not a lot of physics goes into that. And then you've got these other methods, just like in external beam treatment planning, that are model-based dose calculations. And then, of course, Monte Carlo is the most, has the most physics content in it. So let's compare these methods. The uh, TG43 is the current standard. Most people are using that now. Um, it has full scatter, and it's a water phantom. It doesn't take into account things like homogeneity, inhomogeneities in the body. Similar thing for the separation of the primary and scatter. It's, there's no transport of electrons involved in that. You can get electronic disequilibrium problems and so on, not taken into account. And then collapsed cone does take into account heterogeneities, and it's accurate to the first scatter. And it's just like external beam radiotherapy. It's pretty accurate, and it gives you a pretty good idea of the dose distribution, even if there are inhomogeneities present. And then the, uh, <coughs> the, the uh, Boltzmann equation, um, that's in, and, and you can see these are in different, um, Elector has the CCC method, Varian has the Boltzmann equation method, it's a little, maybe a little bit better, and it does full homogeneities, in homogeneities, and then Monte Carlo, as I say, is probably the gold standard, and I suspect that that's what we're all going to be using in about 20 years' time, maybe 10 years' time probably not five years' time, because the speed of computers is, is getting to such that we can do full Monte Carlo calculations very quickly. So that's probably where we stand. OK, let me summarize. Good, I'm about on time. Let me summarize. Very simple. Brachytherapy can be administered by various routes, dose rates, loading methods, source types, and energies. TG43 significantly improved brachytherapy dosimetry about 20 years ago when it first started. And now we don't have significant errors. I can remember an error. I didn't mention it. But we converted when about 20 years ago when TG43 first came out. And we started looking at the dosimetry of I-125 seeds and palladium seeds. And we discovered we were about 10% in error. The doses were wrong because the old-fashioned dosimetry and now the new dosimetry. And so we used to give, if I remember correctly, 145 gray for a permanent iodine implant. It came down to, I think, 120. No, 100 and, 130, about 130 gray. So a sudden big shift. No, I, I've got it wrong. It was 160 gray, and it came down to 145 gray. About a 10% shift, and we did the same thing for, for uh, palladium. So it, there were big errors involved. TG43 significantly reduced those errors. And then finally, model-based dose calculations are beginning to be incorporated in the commercial treatment planning systems, and hopefully this will improve the dosimetry even more. OK, anybody got any questions? Or is it too early? <laughs> yes. Uh, can you speak up so everybody can hear your question? I'm asking about the, this electrolyte therapy. Are they limited to the tissue level or is it for? No. Electronic brachytherapy can be used anywhere and is being used anywhere in the body for breast implants, for prostate implants. Um, anytime you can put a catheter into a patient, you can use electronic brachytherapy. Let me tell you one problem with electronic brachytherapy today in America. I don't know if they'll be the same elsewhere. And that is, it's a stupid problem in my opinion. You're only allowed to use your source, your little x-ray tube, 
on an individual patient. You can't use that same source on another patient. So they have to throw it away and get a new one. It's, well, they don't throw it away, they keep it for doing physics experiments on. But you, you, you can't use it. It's silly, they're worried about contamination and so on, but how can that be? I mean, use the high dose rate source on one patient to the next, why can't you use it? So that's a problem in America, which is probably why electronic battery therapy hasn't taken off much more than it has. But I suspect that that won't last. That's, people are going to come to their senses and, and be able to do it. So anything that you use uh, regular Another sources. Question is, uh, how can you verify in manual, in manual calculation the treatment time of a supply? Yes. Well, there, there are lots of ways of doing that that have been published. Um, you can't do the whole calculation. So you pick a point and you check what it is at the point. I rem my wife's a medical physicist. I remember she started doing I-125 implants for the first time probably 25 years ago. And she, she said she, she got the treatment planning computer system and everything was working fine. I said, well, why don't you do some tests on it? Take a point, simple point, take a point and do some tests. It was a factor of two in error. Why was it a factor of two in error? Because the, 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 the treatment planning system had just been developed, and they weren't calculating the decay of the source properly. Isn't that simple? Something like that. So it's good to do a point dose comparison. Now, um, one of my ex-students wrote a paper on putting a diode on the patient's surface so let's say you're doing a, a, a treatment of the vagina, and you want to know, is this the right dose? She was putting a, a, a dosimeter over the top of the vagina, marking it on the treatment planning system, where exactly it is, and calculating what dose that should be getting. And that worked out very well. I don't know if anybody's doing that. They probably are. But uh, I thought that was a pretty clever idea for using what everybody has in their department um, ways of measuring point doses, and that worked out ra rather well. And you can detect two or three percent errors that way. Yes, I had a question in the back. What about the patient residual dose in case of uh, iridium 192 and cobalt 60? Patient residual dose. I didn't really understand the question because you're so <laughs> far back. <Okay. laughs> I mean, after treatment. Yes. What about the residual dose for uh, cobalt 60? The residual dose? Anybody understand? Yakov, do you understand? You're, you're closer to me. Now, he didn't understand either. Well, let's talk about it later because we're, we're talking about it over the coffee break because I don't think we understand exactly what, what your question is. Yes, another question. How about the power supply? Right? How about the? The power supply. Oh, to the, um, to the electronic brachytherapy source? Oh, it's, it's just a, it's, it's, not a, it's not a problem. I mean, it's only, it, it's, it's just as if you were feeding the power to a 50 kV x-ray tube. Like in diagnostic radiology, it would be the same kind of thing. And the good thing is you can turn it off. What about the dosimetry? Dosimetry? It's all been done and calculated. Now, is it in TG43? 40, is it in any of these touch group reports? I think it might be. I think uh, or they're working on it if it's not published yet. But, but uh, so that could be, you need accurate dosimetry in order to use it. Right now, there are so few people using it, they've done their own dosimetry. That they've studied it themselves. Is there any difference in radiobiology or point of view for using cobalt 60 and iradium? <coughs> well, I would. Is there any radio? I'm sure there is a difference in radiobiology. Um, the whole body dose will be higher with cobalt 60 because it's higher energy, it spreads to the, the whole body, so that's going to be a big difference. Do the cells themselves know? Probably not, because the damage is being caused by the low energy electrons that are released, the secondary electrons are released. So probably the cells themselves don't know whether it came from cobalt 60 or iridium. 
So the, the biological effect should be the same. Now, electronic battery therapy may be a little different, and I've done some studies on that myself. I, I suspect that eventually we're going to find that there is a little bit of an advantage of electronic brachytherapy. Isodose distributions are very similar, and, and if you're using it, uh, cobalt 60? Um, okay, I wasn't thinking cobalt, but um, most of the treatments, it's mainly inverse square law from the source. You get close to a source, it's mainly inverse square law. There isn't much difference between the sources. A little bit, but not much difference. Yes, Yaka. Um, well, the cobalt-60 sources for brachytherapy are spheres. Geometry is easy. So, I, you're right. I, I don't remember ever seeing that. HDR? Yes. Yeah, they're just spheres. And, and it's a lot easier to do the calculations with spheres. So, so they probably haven't bothered. I mean, I fully agree that I mean, brachytherapy is basically the dominant effect in the sports. Right. right. Are you speaking next? You got some banging going on here. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> you got somebody banging. We have to tell him to stop. <laughs>